conquest and annexation of the Stepstones by the Kingdom of the Three Daughters at first met with only approval from the Lords of Westeros. Order had replaced chaos, and if the Three Daughters demanded a toll of any ship passing through their waters, that seemed a small price to pay to be rid of the pirates. However, the barbaric actions of Kragas Crabfeeder and his partners in conquest soon turned feelings against them. The toll demanded was raised again and again, soon becoming so much that merchants who once paid it gladly now sought to slip past the galleys of the Triarchy as once they had the pirates. The infighting between the three sisters only made the matters worse. Of all the lords of Westeros, none suffered more from these practices as much as Lord Corlys Velaryon, Lord of the Tides, whose fleet had made him as wealthy and powerful as any man in the Seven Kingdom, even raising him for a time above the Lannisters of Castle Rock. The Sea Snake was determined to put an end to the Triarchy's rule over the Stepstones, and in Daemon Targaryen he found a willing partner, eager for gold and glory, that victory in war would bring him. Shunning the King's wedding, they laid their plans at high tide on the Isle of Driftmark. Lord Valerian would command the fleet, Prince Daemon, the army, they would be greatly outnumbered by the forces of the Three Daughters, but the Prince would also bring to battle the fires of his dragon, Caraxes, the Blood Worm. The fighting began in 106 AC. Prince Daemon had little difficulty assembling an army of landless adventurers and second sons and won many victories during the first two years of the conflict. In 108 AC, when at last he came face to face with Kragas Crabfeeder, he slew him single-handed and cut off his head with Dark Sister. King Viserys, doubtless pleased to be rid of his troublesome brother, supported his efforts with regular infusions of gold, and by 109 AC, Daemon Targaryen and his army of cell swords and cutthroats controlled all but two of the islands of the Stepstones, and the Sea Snake's fleet had taken a firm control of the waters between them. During this brief moment of victory, Prince Daemon declared himself King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, and Lord Corlys placed a crown upon his head, but their petty kingdom was far from secure. The next year, the Kingdom of the Three Daughters dispatched a fresh invasion force, under the command of a Tyroshi captain named Relicio Rydun, surely one of the most curious and flamboyant rogues in the annals of history, and Dawn joined the fight in alliance with the Triarchy. Fighting resumed. Though the Stepstones were engulfed in blood and fire, King Viserys and his court remained unperturbed. Let Daemon play at war, King Viserys is reported to have said. It keeps him out of trouble. Viserys was a man of peace, and during these years, King's Landing was an endless round of feasts, balls and tourneys, where mummers and singers heralded the birth of each new Targaryen princeling. Queen Alicent had soon proved to be as fertile as she was pretty. In 107 AC, she bore the king a healthy son, naming him Aegon after the Conqueror. Two years later, she produced a daughter for the king, Helena. In 110 AC, she bore him a second son, Aemon, who was said to be half the size of his elder brother, but twice as fierce. Yet, Princess Rhaenyra continued to sit at the foot of the Iron Throne with her father, when her father held court, and his grace began to bring her to meetings of the small council as well. Though many lords and knights sought her favour, the princess only had eyes for Sir Criston Cole, the young champion of the Kingsguard, and her constant companion. Sir Criston protects the princess from her enemies. Who protects the princess from Sir Criston? Queen Alicent asked one day at court. The enmity between Alicent Hightower and her stepdaughter had proven short-lived, for both Rhaenyra and Alicent aspired to be the first lady of the realm, and though the queen had given the king not one, but two male heirs, Viserys had done nothing to change the order of succession. The princess of Dragonstone remained his acknowledged heir, with half the lords of Westeros sworn to defend her rights. Those who asked what of the ruling of the Great Council of 101 found their words falling on deaf ears. The matter had been decided, so far as King Viserys was concerned. It was not an issue his grace cared to revisit. Still, questions persisted, not least from Queen Alicent herself. Landless among her supporters was her father, Sir Otto Hightower, Hand of the King. Pushed too far on the matter in 109 AC, Viserys stripped Sir Otto of his chain of office and named in his place Lord of Harrenhal, Lionel Strong. This hand will not hector me, his grace proclaimed. Even after Sir Otto had returned to Old Town, a Queen's party still existed at court, a group of powerful lords friendly to Queen Alicent and supportive of the rights of her sons. Against them was pitted the party of the princess. King Viserys loved both his wife and his daughter, and hated conflict and contention. He strove all his days to keep the peace between his women, and to please both with gifts and gold and honours, so long as he lived and ruled, and kept balance, 
the feasts and tourneys continued as before, and peace prevailed throughout the realm. Some with sharp eyes, who observed the dragons of one party snapping and spitting flames at the dragons of the other party whenever they chanced to pass near each other. In 111 AC, a great tourney was held at King's Landing on the fifth anniversary of the King's marriage to Queen Alicent. At the opening feast, the Queen wore a green gown, whilst the Princess dressed dramatically in Targaryen red and black. Note was taken, and thereafter it became the custom to refer to the greens and the blacks when talking of the Queen's party and the party of the Princess. In the tourney itself, the blacks had the much better of it, when Sir Criston Cole, wearing Princess Rhaenyra's favour, unhorsed all of the Queen's champions, including two of her cousins and her youngest brother, Sir Gawain Hightower. Yet there was one who wore neither green nor black but rather gold and silver. Prince Damon had at last returned to court, wearing a crown and styling himself King of the Narrow Sea. He appeared unannounced in the skies above King's Landing on his dragon, circling thrice around the tawny grounds. But when at last he came to the earth, he knelt before his brother and offered his crown as a token of his love and fealty. Viserys returned the crown and kissed Damon on both cheeks, welcoming him home, and the lords and the commons set up thousands of cheers as the sons of the Spring Prince were reconciled. Amongst cheering the loudest was Princess Rhaenyra, who was thrilled at the return of her favourite uncle and begged him to stay a while. The events that followed are hotly debated, but what is known is Prince Damon did remain in King's Landing for half a year. He even resumed his seat on the small council, according to Grand Maester Runciter, but neither age nor exile had changed his nature. Damon soon took up again with the old companions from the Gold Cloaks and returned to the establishments along the Street of Silk where he had been such a valued patron. Though he treated Queen Alison with all courtesy due her station, there was no warmth between them and men said that the prince was notably cool towards her children, especially his nephews, Aegon and Aemon, whose birth had pushed him still lower down the order of succession. Princess Rhaenyra was a different matter. Damon spent long hours in her company, enthralling her with tales of his journeys and battles. He gave her pearls and silks and books, and even a jade tiara, said once to have belonged to the Empress of Leng, read poems to her, dined with her, hawked with her, sailed with her, entertained her by making mock of the greens at court, the lip spittle fawning over Queen Alicent and her children. He praised her beauty, declaring her the fairest maiden in all of the Seven Kingdoms. Uncle and niece began to fly together almost daily, racing Syrax and Carax as a dragonstone and back. Now, here is where our sources diverge. Grand Maester Runcita says brothers quarrelled again, and Prince Damon departed King's Landing to return to the Stepstones and his wars. Of the cause of the quarrel, he did not speak. Others assert that it was Queen Alicent's urging that Viserys and Damon away, but set in Eustace and Mushroom tell another tale, or rather, two such tales, each different from the other. Eustace, the less salacious of the two, writes that Prince Damon seduced his niece to princess and claimed her maidenhood when the lovers were discovered abed by sir arek cargill of the king's guard and brought before the king rhaenyra insisted she was in love with her uncle and pleaded with her father for leave to marry him king viserys would not hear of it however and reminded his daughter that prince damon already had a wife in his wrath he confided his daughter to her bedchambers told his brother to depart and commanded both of them never to speak of what happened the tale told by mushroom is far more depraved as is often the case with his testimony according to the dwarf it was Sir Criston Cole the princess yearned for, not Prince Damon, but Sir Criston was a true knight, noble and chaste, and mindful of his vows, and though he was in her company day and night, he never so much as kissed her, nor made any declaration of his love. When he looks at you, he sees the little girl you were, not the woman you have become, Damon told his niece, but I can teach you how to make him see you as a woman. Damon began giving her kissing lessons, if Mushroom is to be believed. From there, the prince went on to show his niece how to best touch a man, bring him pleasure, at night, he would smuggle her from her rooms, dressed as a page boy, and take her secretly to the brothels along the street of silk, where the princess could observe men and women in the act of love and learn more of these womanly arts from the harlots of King's Landing. Just how long these lessons continued, Mushroom does not say, but unlike Septon Eustace, he insists that Princess Rhaenyra remained a maiden, for she wished to preserve her innocence as a gift for her beloved. But when at last she approached her white knight, Using all she had learned, Sir Criston was horrified and spurned her. The whole tale came out, in no small part thanks to Mushroom himself. King Viserys at first refused to believe a word of it, until Prince Damon confirmed the tale was true. Give the girl to me to wife, he purportedly told his brother. Who else will take her now? Instead, King Viserys sent him into exile never to return to the Seven Kingdoms on pain of death. Lord Strong, the King's Hand, argued that the prince should be put to death immediately, 
as a traitor, Perceptin Eustace reminded his grace that no man is accursed as a kingslayer. Of the aftermath, these things are certain. Daemon Targaryen returned to the Stepstones and resumed his struggle for those barren, storm-swept rocks. Grand Maester Runciter and Sir Harold Westling both died in 112 AC, so Kristen Cole was named Lord Commander of the Kingsguard in Sir Harold's place and the Archmaesters of the Citadel sent Maester Melos to the Red Keep to take up the Grand Maester's chain and duties. Elsewise, King's Landing returned to customary tranquility for the best part of two years, until 113 AC, when Princess Rhaenyra 1016 took possession of Dragonstone as her own seat and married.